with my greetings from the uh, city of Irvine in Southern California to all the participants at the ninth International Conference on Water Resources and Arid Environments. I am Sarush Sarushian, a professor at the University of California, Irvine here, and also the director of Center for Hydrometeorology and Remote Sensing. I thank the, part, the organizers of the meeting for inviting me to give a talk. And without any further delay, I will start sharing the screen because these days, most of our communications, unfortunately, are not in person and we have to use media such as Zoom. So bear with me and I hope uh, you will uh, benefit from my talk. So my presentation is about um, measuring rainfall from satellite observations over the entire planet, uh, which really is an important uh, aspect these days for climate studies and many other applications. So uh, bear with me for a second. And I'd like to acknowledge all the agencies in the United States, such as NASA, NOAA, and the international programs which we cooperate, such as UNESCO, uh, in uh, involvement in our project. So as I said, I'm at the University of California, Irvine. It's one of the 10 campuses of the University of California system. And we have about 33,000 students uh, with the total of 250,000 in all the 10 campuses. I usually acknowledge all the students and colleagues of mine who have collaborated with me and the last row of uh, have been uh, represented recent graduates or the current PhD students in our program. As a hydrologist and hydroclimatologist, we are interested in understanding how the water cycle on our planet functions and uh, its elements are precipitation, runoff, uh, evaporation, and uh, both surface runoff and groundwater. So in order to better understand and model this, we require information. So we try to observe the system, learn from the data, and use that knowledge to develop models uh, for future predictions. If you are interested in knowing exactly the little history of how observations have come to being, if we take this line as the present time and uh, look at the past, the past you know, billion years of the Earth, Earth of our planet, uh, we don't have too much observations, unfortunately, in the past. The only period that we have had instruments developed to measure, such as runoff, rainfall, and many other temperature, it only uh, extends to maybe several hundred years out of the entire history of the planet. Prior to that, we rely on maybe some isotope chemistry of uh, earth material in order to kind of get projections of the past, such as even the ice cores uh, that we are able to analyze the bubbles using isotope uh, chemistry in order to figure out uh, what was the climate conditions up to 200,000 years ago. When it comes to satellites, it's been only maybe 50 years or so that we have been benefiting from having satellites to make observations of our planet. And all of that knowledge we learn from, we try to put it to good use and develop models. And you've heard of climate models, hydrologic models, many different types of models that are available and are used uh, for prediction of the future from short-term floods all the way to climate scale of decades to centennials. My talk is only uh, going to focus on satellite observations and how we have benefited from that. At the present time, we have a whole host of Earth observing satellites that pretty much cover much of our planet. And this is an international effort uh, by many countries, um, satellites from the US, Japan, uh, European Space Agency, 
China, Russia, India, and many other countries do the partnerships in order to make observations from top of the atmosphere all the way to ocean surface and maybe below and some of the soil moisture in our earth. So the way satellite observations work, if this is the range where human eyes see in the visible range in the wavelength or the electromagnetic spectrum. Beyond that, our eyes cannot see, but if we have the right sensors, we can actually sense how they are behaving. For instance, if we have a satellite sensor that is uh, in this particular range, it can distinguish between bare soil and a green vegetated soil and whether we have vegetation that is stressed when we have droughts and uh, ocean water. So these spectrums that are seen by the satellite center, sensor are full of information and knowledge that we have to use to our advantage and uh, to see beyond what our human eyes see. My work and my group's work has been on uh, one of the key requirements for hydrometeorological studies and that's precipitation. It's one of the biggest challenges of uh, our hydrologic cycle. How do we measure, for instance, a thunderstorm of this scale uh, with instruments that we have? We have three types of instrumentations at our disposal. We have rain gauges, which are the traditional method by which rain has been measured. The biggest, uh, it's a great uh, thing to measure exactly the amount of rain that falls on the ground, the biggest problem is that we cannot cover the earth surface with too many of them because it becomes expensive. So there are rain gauges at different locations, but not dense enough to really capture the heterogeneity of rainfall over an area from thunderstorms and frontal systems. Then we have radars. Uh, radars are great, but they have their own limitations. Uh, they send the signal, hits the hydrometeors, and then comes back and through the mathematical ways by which we can process it. Then we have satellites. Which one to trust? It's a big question. And then the combination of them perhaps is the way to go in the future, which we are trying to do that. So when it comes to this satellite observation of rainfall and estimating rainfall, we have three types of satellites at our disposal. We have the geostationary satellites, which are about 35,000 kilometers above the Earth, and they are synchronized to rotate with the rotation of the Earth. So it really senses the cloud top temperatures, and every 15 to 30 minutes, uh, the data comes down to the, to, the, to the receiving stations. Then we have passive microwaves, which are uh, only covering the Earth twice a day, every location, and uh, but they have an advantage being closer to the Earth. At the same time, we only get a snapshot and we have to wait 12 hours later to get another snapshot over the same area. And then we have active radon in space. The difference between them are exhibited here. Geostationary satellites, different countries have, have um, launched uh, these style satellites. So the US has a number of them, Europeans have it, Chinese have it, Japanese have it. Uh, so they covers the entire earth uh, at any given time. And that's what we see on weather uh, news usually. So for the United States, we have two satellites, goes west and goes east, which cover much of the Atlantic and Pacific, as well as the whole United States and South America. And uh, in the old days, as of maybe some years ago, three, four, five years ago, the satellites only had six, uh, five channels in the electrospectrum uh, field. But nowadays with the new generation of satellites, we have more channels like 16 channels. And that is additional information that can be used to try to improve our estimates of rainfall. So if you have an active uh, remote sensing sensor, signal is sent from the satellite, bounces off the clouds and then, um, or earth, and then we capture that signal and we can distinguish whether a piece of cloud has a rainfall in it or it's not raining. 
uh, passive microwaves is only passive in the sense that it receives a signal from the uh, sun, radiation and uh, radiation, radiation on clouds versus land versus water sends a different type of signals and you try to extract the information from that. Uh, we have advanced quite a bit in terms of measuring rainfall, the global precipitation mission, which is a joint venture between Japan and the US has been launched since 2014. And every three hours is now mapping the rainfall over our planet and the algorithms that are used to try to estimate the rainfall is a joint activity between our university and of course, NASA is the lead and NOAA as well. So, Persian system, which is precipitation estimation from remotely sensed information using artificial neural network was developed uh, in our center. And previous to that, I was at the University of Arizona. It was the work that started there in the early 1900s. And I was honored uh, by receiving the 2010 Prince Sultan Ben Abdulaziz International Prize for Water uh, for essentially the work we did on the satellite estimations, which is uh, the citation was for development of Persian models to estimate precipitation from satellites. So it was a great trip to Riyadh and very much memorable and uh, receiving this award. So what is the main structure of our system is that we have a machine learning tool, which is based on artificial neural network and the data that comes from satellites is processed through this and converted into estimates of rainfall. And it's a little bit more elaborate uh, in terms of its capabilities. And unfortunately, not much time to get to the details of it. So what is unique about our approach and was uh, partly reason for me to receive the award was that we were the first group to use artificial neural networks or machine learning tools in order to extract the information from the satellite data that we received. So in a neural network, if you wish, it's, this is uh, kind of mimicked as a human brain. And uh, we have various inputs coming in. There are internal nodes in this model that try to convert it into the type of outputs you want. And uh, we have used the ability of these models to do it. What has resulted since the award has been quite a bit of progress, which I'm happy to report to you. We have now three different data uh, websites, which is uh, CHRS RainSphere, which is a climate data set, which uh, we have CHRS iRain, which is a real time weather scale data set. And we have a data portal that allows people to come for free to get the information. Thanks to the work of Fu Wen, uh, Dr. Fu Wen in my group, um, who was a student, now is an a, a, a assistant professor in our department. We developed a very user-friendly data based on the work, and it's from 83 to the present, based on the work of a previous PhD student, Dr. Hamad Ashuri, with the leadership of Dr. Colin Su, who is one of my colleagues. This data set was developed for the national, uh, this, uh, NOAA, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and it's served on their computer system. It's a daily precipitation data that covers from 83, 60 north to 60 south, and spatial resolution is pretty high at 25 kilometer by 25 kilometer. What this allows us to do is we have 35 years, uh, 38 years of data, you can zoom in to one given year and see it by month. You can zoom in further and see for a given month on a daily basis, how much rainfall may have fallen over the area of your interest. Uh, here are some examples over Saudi Arabia since the meeting is uh, hosted uh, by the kingdom. Uh, the data, for instance, from our rain sphere, you can see you can look at the data and look at the seasonality or the uh, annual variability of rainfall. The rainy season for you starts maybe in November and lasts maybe through April or May. Uh, so you see the average precipitation that has happened over Saudi Arabia. And uh, the features of this are through a tutorial that you can see and be able to use it uh, for any country or for any uh, 
division uh, like province, etc. If you look at the country as a whole from our data, which is a high resolution, you see which regions of the country get more precipitation, which is of course in the southern part of the country and uh, the range is like two to 500 uh, millimeters per year on the average. There are the two corners of the country that uh, of course uh, show uh, less rainfall, uh, which is in the orders of uh, maybe a uh, few millimeters to hundreds of millimeters. If from the same data set, you can look at the historical perspective and you see that unfortunately over the kingdom, over the past 38 years of our data, it shows that statistically decreasing trend in the amount of precipitation over the whole country. And we also have a trend component of this website that you can compare the conditions of precipitation with respect to the other countries in the world, for instance, and you see that some of the countries in Africa have seen an increase in precipitation. Unfortunately, the Middle Eastern countries of Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Iran, and others have seen somewhat of a decline of precipitation. You can also get into more details by going into provinces or political divisions of the country and uh, look at to see which areas got more rainfall or which areas have received less rainfall. Our next component is, of course, the uh, um, what we call the real-time rainfall, which is a high resolution, a four kilometer resolution. Uh, and every half an hour, this data gets updated. We have also applications for Androids as well as for iPhones, iOS. Uh, if you Google iRain, you can download it for free. And this is an integrated system for real-time precipitation estimation. It has uh, quite a bit of capabilities built into it. And this one allows you to go and use the various fields that you wish. And uh, from that, you can get the patterns of precipitation over the United States. We also have uh, incorporated gauge information almost real time as well as radar. So people can do the comparison. You can look at the precipitation at a given point, or you can look at the evolution of the storms. And this is available that uh, people use uh, globally. And uh, this is an example of a storm about 10 days ago happening in the United States. And uh, we have plotted it and the blue represents uh, what our estimates are from satellite and the greens represent what the radar showed. And you see quite a fair comparison of the information. We are delighted to see that our data is good. Uh, our data, as, as I said, is served on our data portal and anyone interested can come and actually grab the data and download it for their applications or use. Uh, who uses our data? From 211 countries. And uh, we keep monitoring the data uh, downloads from our site and how many people come and use our data. And as you see, United States, uh, followed by some private companies and others that come and get the data, followed by China and so on. If you go down the list, you'll see. Um, so what we have done, uh, we were uh, happy to have Dr. Raed al Harbi, who is now a assistant professor at King Saud University, uh, to be a graduate student in our program under the leadership of Professor Colin Shu. And at that time, we did have a project funded by the Ministry of Water Resources and Agriculture, and we developed a tool for Saudi Arabia and uh, Rayed was the one who calibrated it against all the gauge information that was provided. And uh, that system was developed and delivered to the ministry. And uh, we are at the present time discussing and hoping to continue our work of uh, calibrating and updating the information and maintaining the system for the kingdom. Uh, in terms of the capabilities, here is our real-time rainfall estimate as of this morning. I just downloaded this uh, at um, you know time 16 uh, of March, 
And if you see, uh, you will see a little bit of precipitation is shown in our system um, over the kingdom. And uh, otherwise it's pretty dry as compared to some of the neighboring countries, you see some of the patterns of rainfall. And every half hour that information gets um, uh, pretty much uh, uh, adjusted. So to come to a conclusion, um, great progress in remote sensing of rainfall in the past three decades uh, with the global implications because these data sets cover much uh, all of the planet. Um, and, but however, much more improvements are required to achieve acceptable accuracy. We are the first to admit like anything new, they're not perfect all the time and there are deficiencies and it's key is in a research environment like ours, with excellent students like Riot that we had and many others, uh, we are able to make these improvements as the knowledge and technology and improvements in the mathematical approaches of machine learning and data um, becomes available. Uh, lastly, it's improving the quality of hydrologic observations should be a nonstop objective. And by building these databases over time, you are enabling the future generation to really have data as opposed to lack of information to see what patterns have occurred, to what extent climate change is impacting and the data that you get on a real time basis gives the ability to be better prepared for the hydrologic hazards of major floods, uh, flash floods, that are now becoming a common occurrence as a result of the intensification of the hydrologic cycle of the planet. With that, I again thank you, the, thank the organizers for inviting me. And I'm sorry because of the virtual nature of this meeting, I'm unable to participate and receive some questions and clarifications if anybody has. Uh, feel free to communicate with me via email, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. With that, I thank you and wish you a successful meeting.